three nights ago, I ordered myself a very slutty pizza. I mean, the bitch was dripping. That dirty little stuffed crust wants to be in me so bad. I just ate the little tart like she meant nothing to me, and she loved it. That pretty much nailed that, and it was pretty late by now, so I dragged myself upstairs and got into the office, or my bed, and tried to work on the figures for the cafe. I run a guinea pig themed cafe, but it's out of cash and it's going to close unless a cheque falls out of the sky or a banker comes in my arse, but neither are going to happen and I don't want to dignify the banker man with a proper mention, so I'm not going to talk about him or how I do sometimes wish I could own up to not having any morals and just let him come on my ass for £10,000, but apparently we're not supposed to do that, so okay, I won't, even though it would solve everything. I won't, even though it could. Lying in my office, the cafe numbers start to jump out at me like little ninjas, so I rationalise it would be good to just switch off for a bit improved my mind, so I watched a pretty good movie, actually, called Seventeen Again with Zac Efron, who is fit, I know, but seriously, he's actually a, a really good actor, so yeah, but the film could have been worse, honestly, check it out. Then that finished, so I lay there, thinking, cafe, numbers, numbers, Zac, numbers, googled Obama to keep up with, you know, who as it turns out is also attractive. Lay there, numbers, numbers, Obama, numbers, Zack, Obama, numbers, Zack. Suddenly I was on new porn having a horrible wank. Found just the right sort of gangbang. Now that really knocked me out, so I put my computer away, leaned over, kissed my boyfriend Harry goodnight and went to sleep. I stood staring at a handprint on my wall from when I had a threesome on my period. Harry, my boyfriend and I, break up every 12 to 18 months, and when we do, well, I wish I could tell you that my threesome story was sticky and awkward, and everyone went home a little bit sad and empty, but it was lovely. Sorry. I admire how much Harry commits to our breakups, the fridge is a new detail, but he does always go the extra mile. A few times he's even cleaned the whole flat, like it's a crime scene. I've often considered timing a breakup around whenever the flat needs a bit of a going over, but I never know what's going to set him off keeps me on my toes. I sit on the loo and think about all the people I can have sex with now. I'm not obsessed with sex. I just can't stop thinking about it. The performance of it. The awkwardness of it. The drama of it. The moment you realise that someone wants your body. Not so much the feeling of it. I open the cafe with my friend Boo. She's dead now. She accidentally killed herself. It wasn't her intention, but it wasn't a total accident. She didn't think she'd actually die, she just found out that her boyfriend slept with someone else and she wants to punish him by ending up in hospital and not letting him visit her for a bit. She decided to walk into a busy cycle lane wanting to get tangled in a bike. Break a finger maybe. But it turns out that bikes can go fast and flip you onto the road. Three people died. She was such a dick. I didn't tell her parents the truth. I told her boyfriend. He cried a lot. Boo's death hit the papers. Local cafe girl is hit by a bike, and a car, and another bike. There was a buzz around the cafe all of a sudden. Flowers, notes, guinea pig memorabilia were all left outside in her memory. Boo made sense of the guinea pig theme. She was all small and cute and put guinea pig pictures everywhere. I pretend they're not there, which I suspect makes the whole guinea pig cafe experience a bit creepy. Boo was built a bit like a guinea pig. No waist or hips, straight down. She rocked it. And she was beautiful. Tricky though. Jealous, sensitive, but beautiful and my best friend. Welcome to Women Speak. The lecture will commence in five minutes. Please have your tickets ready. I find my sister outside the lecture hall. She's uptight and beautiful and probably anorexic, but clothes look awesome on her so... Mum died two years ago, but she had a double mastectomy and never really recovered. It was particularly hard because she had amazing boobs. She used to say that I was lucky because mine will never get in the way. When I asked her what she meant, she used to demonstrate by pretend struggling to open the fridge or pretending to not be able to see what's on the floor. My sister's got whoppers, but she got all of Mum's good bits. 
Dad's way of coping with two motherless daughters was to buy us tickets to feminist lectures, start fucking our godmother and eventually stop calling. These lectures are every three months. It's virtually the only time I see my sister. She looks tired. We sit in the waiting room. I realise that I'm wearing the top that she lost years ago, so this is going to be tense. She really fucking loved this top. Her eyes fix on it, but... And I can see her brain ticking. She decides to bank it for later. Makes me nervous. Ammo. She reads her Kindle. She's done her hair a bit fancy. I wonder if she's going out after the lecture, or if she's just got her period. She always does something a bit different around her period. She gets really bad PMT. Mom called it a monthly confidence crisis, but it was PMT. The only way she can get by is to reinvent herself in some small way. One particularly bad month, she came into the kitchen on the brink of tears. In full lycra. Even Dad had to leave the room. She looked like she climbed into a condom. It was an emotionally complex couple of days, which we're not allowed to talk about anymore. She's sitting so still. She's definitely having a monthly confidence crash. I mean, it's in the plaits. Either side, sort of tied up at the top. It's unbearable. I can't resist. Hair looks nice. Fuck off. Brilliant. She asks about work and I get all spiky. I tell her the cafe's lease is up in two days, unless I can find five grand, which is impossible. So I'm having to deal with letting go of the only thing I have left of Boo, and the only thing that's going to save me from becoming a corporate slave lady like her, and I know that everyone thought I'd fuck it up, and now it looks like I've fulfilled everyone's expectations. Which I didn't mean to say, it just falls out, and now I'm going to get her smugness all up in my face. She just looks at me, no reaction. I know the rules. So I ask her about her super high powered, perfect job work super life. She tells me that she's finally been offered the wet dream of a job in Finland. Apparently they want to overpay and underwork her and she won't have to wear parasuits anymore. Wow, Finland! But she's turning it down because her husband says she shouldn't go. Because of Jake. Jake is a stepson. He's really weird. Probably clinically. But no one talks about that. He freaks out if she's away longer than a day, and he's got this thing about trying to get into the bath with her? He's 15. I tell her, he's not your son. That's not the point. Don't make that face. I didn't make a face. Go. This is about you. I knew you'd say that. I tell her she's making a mistake. She shouldn't let other people get in the way of what she really wants, and Finland is what she really wants. She told me her husband isn't other people, that her husband is her life. I tell her that her husband tried to touch me up at Christmas. I don't know why I said it. It's true, but he was drunk, so... Martin's always drunk, which is odd because she's so straight. Maybe that's not odd, but he's very good at being drunk, in that he's a fern drunk. No one wants to admit there's a problem, because then they don't get to have crazy nights with fun drunk Martin anymore. I give her half my sandwich, which she eats. Maybe she isn't anorexic. Maybe clothes just... BITCH! She pulls out a card from Dad and puts it on the seat between us. It's probably still there. Women Speak is about to commence. Please enter the auditorium. The lecture hall is huge. We go right to the front and sit down. Still can't read her. Suddenly she says, I'm going to go to fucking Finland. Okay. I hate these suits. Okay. How much money do you need to keep Boo's Cafe? About five grand. Okay, I'll transfer it tomorrow. But I don't want to come to these anymore. Okay. And I want my top back. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Shutting up shop. Like she was drunk, which we often were. School kids used to come to the cafe, mainly because of Hillary. Basically, I'm shit at presents, and for Boo's birthday two years ago, I panicked and brought her a guinea pig. She called it Hillary, and now I'm left with it. I don't feel anything about guinea pigs. They're pointless. But Boo took Hillary very seriously as a gift, and then everything became guinea pig related. I think she was just relieved to have a different animal associated with it. When she was about five, she mentioned, on a childish whim, that she liked owls. For the rest of her life, she got owls. 
owl duvet covers, owl pens, books about owls, trips to owl sanctuaries. She fucking hated owls. Show her an owl and she'd lose her shit. What she really liked, and I knew this, was screwdrivers. Crazy about them. We'd spend hours on screwing things, then screwing them back up. She slept with screwdrivers under a pillow until she was about ten. Come to think of it, a screwdriver would have been a better present than a guinea pig. Midday. Still haven't heard from my sister. Martin's going to hate me. I picture his hairy, Scottish face. Hope he hasn't beaten the shit out of her or anything. No, he'd never do something as sexy as that. I'm joking. Jesus. Hilary is fat and ginger with frizzy bits. Like Annie, the orphan. If she was grown up. And fat. And a guinea pig. Which, well, who knows what became of her. She has this punky little bit of fur that explodes on the crown of her head and falls over her eyes, which makes her pretty badass. She has a really straight expression. Boo always said, if Hilary was in a band, she'd be the guitarist who takes the music very seriously. She's also a sneaky little shit. She knows how to open her hutch door. I've seen her do it. She pushes the little wood stopper until it drops out and the door just swings open. She then freezes as if she hasn't done anything. Then she actually turns around, not joking, and lowers herself onto the counter, little legs kicking, looking over her shoulder, checking, checking, every now and again. She often does a little poo in excitement. Once landed, she creeps along the counter all the way to the window. Then when she gets there, in her frenzy of freedom, she sits down and looks out, watching the world. If she wants me to think she's really profound and poetic doing that, I'm not rising to it. Apparently, guinea pigs need other guinea pigs, or they can die of loneliness. But Hilary didn't need a mate. She got more than enough attention. The punters loved her. She was always on someone's lap, and she had Boo, who never left her alone. They adored each other. The morning Boo's boyfriend told her he'd fuck someone else, she walked right past me, took Hilary out of her hutch, and sat in the back with her for hours. I once read a story from the paper to Boo and Hilary about how a little kid repeatedly stuck rubber-ended pencils up the class hamster's arsehole because he liked it when their eyes popped out. He was sent to a juvenile boot camp. I read it as a bit of a joke, but Boo was distraught. They sent him away, but he needs help. She was a surprising person. He pencil fucked a hamster. He's obviously not happy. Happy people don't do things like that. Fair point. And anyway, that's the very reason people put rubbers on the end of pencils. To fuck hamsters? No, because people make mistakes. But now, Boo's gone. It's a deaf cafe, so no one comes in. Hilary just sits on her hutch like a lump, staring at me. I don't know what to do with her. Nine o'clock in the morning. My sister's door. Martin's looking at me. Hello, ye. It's Claire here? Yeah. I try to get past him into the house. He doesn't let me. Claire comes to the door. She's crimped her fringe. I make a beautifully constructed joke about it. She snaps at me. Says I have to stop talking to people like I'm doing a stand-up routine. That some things just aren't fucking funny. I laugh. And then I don't laugh. My throat goes dry. No one says anything for a bit. You didn't transfer the money? No. You're not going to Finland? No. Why is he still here? He didn't touch you. He tried. He said it was more like the other way around. That's not true. Why would I believe you? What? Because I'm- After what you did to Boo. That wasn't my fault. He wanted me. He wanted me. Okay, I'll admit it. I fucked that cafe into liquidation. I fucked up my family. I fucked my friend by fucking her boyfriend. But I don't feel alive unless I'm fucked and I don't feel in control unless I'm fucking. Because fucking makes the world tighten around me. 
that I've been watching people suck for as long as I've been able to turn on a computer, but I know my body now really is the only thing I have, and then when that gets old and fucked, I might as well kill it, that I wish I never knew fucking existed because somehow there isn't anything worse than someone who doesn't want to fuck me, that I fuck everything, but this time, I genuinely wasn't trying to. I wasn't. I was... Either everyone feels like this a little bit and they're just not talking about it, or I'm completely fucking alone, which isn't fucking funny. What is this? Is this a guinea? Did you get me a... what? <laughs> what is it? I don't know. Something to love? 